Hey everybody, welcome back to another video. Today I'm joined uh, with Brad. We're gonna be doing a top five list for everyone today. And Brad is someone that ironically, I actually do not know. I've just kind of met him right now. He's joining me and um, we kind of know each other through some social media kind of platforms and some, some gaming social media platforms where we've just decided during the pandemic that we would connect and do a top five for everyone today. So um, this is kind of an interesting thing for me because most of the people I do videos with are people that I've actually gamed with, that I've actually met, that I actually know. Um, I've not met, met Brad, I've not gamed with him, but we have talked a little bit over the internet and stuff. So hello, thank you for joining me, Brad. Hi, Andrew. Thanks for uh, inviting me and letting me be on your, on your channel here. No problem. So what we're doing today is um, we're going to do a top five list, which I'll get into. But first, Brad, if you want to just kind of talk about like games and what got you into gaming and kind of tell us your story. Sure thing. Um, growing up, I guess, we played some family type games with my, my family and things like that. Nothing major. Um, what really, really started me into gaming was... Uh, in the mid '90s, I, I was playing Magic: The Gathering. Kind of got into that with some of my friends in high school. Um, you know, did that for heavily for probably five or six years or so into college a little bit. Um, I ended up selling off my cards at some point, which, looking back, seems kind of dumb now. But uh, regardless, um, you know, fast forward to about 2011 or so, um, my cousin and his wife, who live in Denver, came up and were staying with with my wife and me. And uh, he brought a couple games with him. He brought Carcassonne and picked the ride. And, uh, you know, I said, well, let's go ahead and play. Um, we busted out Carcassonne. And quite honestly, that was the game that kind of opened this this world to me. Um, you know, it was seeing something different from a roll and move um, where I actually I was creating, we were creating the board as we were playing, you know, laying the tiles down for the map, um, just different ways to, to come up with scoring and things like that, it really um, excited me and, and got me considering the situation, you know, different things we could do with gaming. Um, and from there, I, I started looking up some things, you know, got on the internet, did some Google searches, um, and uh, ended up finding Board Game Geek and started looking at some of the higher ranked games, more popular sure. ones at the time. Uh, ended up getting uh, Dominion and a few of those expansions for Dominion um, and just kind of fell down the rabbit hole from there so to speak um, and so uh, you know started playing with my friends as much as I could and, and that's kind of where it went. So would you would you say was Dominion the first game that you actually bought that you purchased? Well I think I think I actually did buy a, the Carcassonne big box first and First. my friends started playing, yep, and they started playing that with me. But then, yeah, I got Dominion, and we started getting into that a bit. So I, I suppose Magic the Gathering would qualify as, like, your first game? Yeah, I would say Magic, definitely. Yeah. I had a pretty decent collection way back when, so. <laughs> I dabbled a little bit with Magic, but I've kind of moved on. That sounds kind of bad, but I've moved on, and I played some other games such as like Netrunner and uh, Legend of the Five Rings and some cooperative um, deck building sort of card games like the Arkham Horror card game that I absolutely love and stuff like that so I do not currently play Magic I did play the the Star Wars Decipher game in the 90s like rest in peace mm -hmm. um, yeah I have some of those cards around. Most of them are my brothers, I think. And so I don't know what to do with them. I should probably contact them and say, like, do we want to try to sell these or what? Because, I mean, they literally got just huge things of dust on them. But <laughs> that was, um, for me, it was uh, Arkham Horror, the second edition. This is a board game. Um, it's a cooperative, very thematic, very long sort of, they put out like hundred expansions for it. And now they have a third edition out, um, that I recently picked up. And so that was kind of what brought me into, so I've always been more of a thematic gamer than a, than what they would call a Euro gamer. So what, what do you consider yourself more like an American gamer or a Euro gamer? Oh, right now I would say I'm definitely a Euro gamer. Um, oh, really? Yeah, I was very much a thematic gamer when I first started, you know, getting into the hobby. Um, 
but it's probably I'm an engineer, I'm an electrical engineer. So maybe it's just my personality to like, you know, puzzles see things streamlined. Stuff. Yeah, puzzles mm -hmm. and streamlined designs. And I really appreciate those clean designs now. Um, I'm not against, you know, obviously I'd, I love to play almost any type of game. Um, but I've lost a little bit of patience for uh, fiddliness, you know, to try to, to try to force theme into games and that adds fiddliness into the rules and things like that. Okay. Um, and a lot more complication that does start to bother me a little bit more than it used to. <laughs> Do you have an example you can throw out there? Um, well, um, yeah, one of my, probably the earliest game that I just called my favorite was Robinson Crusoe. Oh, and, okay. um, you know, when you get to the end of the round and there's all these different little rules you gotta, you know, and it feels like a bunch of them are just, to meet thematically and it's a it's a great game and i still would love to play it but i don't like that i gotta keep pulling out the rule book all the time to try to remember how to finish a round and things like that it just didn't seem real intuitive to me um and so that got a little tiring after a while i <clears throat> i enjoy robinson crusoe it was on my 10 by 10 uh, a couple years ago i bought the the expansion mystery uh, what's it mystery tales it's got kind of a little campaign in it I have not played it but i do own it um one game that i've been messing around with a lot lately and i'm going to be putting some videos up is this war of mine which is basically robinson crusoe but just with a different theme but it's it feels the exact same thing like you're trying to keep your shelter feed your people make sure nobody gets goes hungry make sure no one gets attacked in Robinson Crusoe. It's usually an animal attack. And this one, it's usually like a sniper. Um, mm -hmm. It feels, it scratches that same itch as Robinson Crusoe, but thematically it's, it's really kind of a, a darker game. Um, okay. So cool. <clears throat> All right. So I'm going to talk about what we did for our top five list that we're doing. Cause we did something really kind of, limited and like esoteric um <clears throat> excuse me so what brad and i kind of talked about for doing um top five games we threw out a couple ideas but one that he wanted to do was we wanted to look at games that had uh, player counts of six or more that were uh not party games and not what we'd call social deduction games such as like secret hitler or the resistance or even like bang um there's a bang like card game or dice game those would be more like social deduction games so we're trying to basically put together a list of non-party six plus player games now um for me um how i kind of ranked mine and i also did one because uh or sorry i did a criteria for me that i didn't put any games on my list in which you need an expansion to play six players because there are some games that are like, you can buy the five or six player expansion. Uh, Agricola would probably be on my list, but it does not, play, you have to buy an expansion to play six players. So it is not on my list. Um, so that's one kind of criteria that I had for me. And then I just went from um, five, three, two, uh, four, three, two, one. And uh, just in the amount of that I, that I play, at least as of the time of making this list. So did you, what about you, Brad? Did you have any kind of criteria that you imposed on yourself? Uh, it was about the same thing. All my games also are, you know, play at least six players right out of the box. Um, I didn't want to make it a list where it was, I really like this game and it also plays six players. Now um, my criteria was more, no, is that if I have six people and I don't want to play a party game per se, I want something with a little more depth. This is a game I'll pull out to play. That's, if if you can make the distinction from what I'm saying there. Um, okay. uh, where it really stemmed from for me was, you know, uh, if I have a group of friends over, uh, typically, you know, people don't like to break into smaller groups. I'm all about breaking into a couple groups of four people or whatever it might be, or okay. two groups of three. Um, but people, are, I find that people want to try to play together. And I'm not always in the mood for party game, or maybe people always aren't. And so I tried to, you know, find these games that would fit had a little bit more depth to them than a party game um but still i could play you know six seven maybe even more players sure okay cool well we'll get uh started i'll start off with um, my number five um i should also say that uh i've been told 
that Brad's got his games there and I have my games here. So we'll just be kind of showing them off on screen, except for one that I'm missing. So I'll just, I'll just throw up the BGG for it. Um, but we'll get there when we get there. So my uh, top five plays six. So it does qualify. It does not play more than six, but it does play uh, six players. It's my number five. Um, it takes the uh, mechanics that most people would be familiar with if they've played ga games of, uh, what is it, um, Yahtzee, of being able to roll and re-roll and keep things and stuff like that, but adds in a dimension of being able to be a monster and like fight with other monsters and things like that. So my number five is called King of Tokyo right here. Uh, King of Tokyo is a pretty fast, uh, easy game to teach easy game to play like i said it's based off of a yahtzee kind of mechanism every person is playing a uh, a monster that's like terrorizing tokyo and you can win through two different ways you can win through like collecting uh star points i forget what they're called in the actual game or you can just be like the last person still um, alive because there's player elimination games usually take about 20 to 25 minutes i guess so not too long and they're really easy. And so if I have six players, um, it's a pretty easy kind of a family medium style game to get to the table to play. Um, and so my number five is uh, King of Tokyo. Have you played this one, Brad? I assume. Uh, I actually have King of New York. I don't know that I've actually ever played King of Tokyo. Um, hmm. And uh, I do enjoy King of New York, but Honestly, it adds just that little bit of extra complexity that I think yep. makes it just a bit harder to teach people. And and I'm, I'm sure that's been a critique for the game is that people actually came back to King of Tokyo because it's a little easier to teach people. But it is a fun game, a King of the Hill style game. Yeah, I, I really enjoy it. Yeah, that's the reason why I don't have uh, King of New York. I have played King of New York through some game nights and stuff people have brought it i've played it two or three times i don't i wouldn't categorize it as like a bad game but i haven't gotten out and bought it because i own as you just saw king of tokyo and if i have the two um just to piggyback on what you said king of new york adds just another layer or two of complexity that if i'm going to get something to the table if i have both options i'm going to say you know what this one's easier to teach and play it's just it hits the table and plays a lot uh, quicker than king of new york yep. so that's my number five okay. uh, over to you all right my number five is uh mysterium now um mysterium's kind of an interesting game it's honestly a, a beautiful game um for those who are familiar with Dixit, um, it has a, you know some of these uh, very abstract cards with you know, abstract artwork on them. But essentially, in Mysterium, one person plays as a ghost, and the rest of the people are playing, um, trying to figure out who the murderer was, um, who who murdered the person who is now the ghost, so to speak. Um, sure. And uh, essentially. Um, what happens is each person's got to figure out almost in clue style who it was, where they did it, and what the uh, what the weapon was, essentially. So it's kind of interesting. People can, you know, get the idea off of clue because people, most people know the game clue, obviously. Um, but the but the ghost is not allowed to say anything. So the ghost will take these cards to, so at first you got to figure out, you know, who the person is. Um, and the, go the ghost will basically take this card that's abstract, hand it to, you know, a card to each person, and they can either look at whatever's on the card, the, the colors of it, um, the theme of the card, if there is a theme or whatever, and try to figure out who the ghost is trying to point at um, or what they're trying to point at through that. Um, I would Now, this is number five on my list, and it's not higher on my list because what I found is, me personally, if I'm the ghost, and I'm playing with six or seven players while this game does play well. And I do like it for this, for the player count. Um, it does slow down just a touch because I've got to hand out, you know, the ghost has to hand out more cards and usually has to think through things a little bit. So it does right. tend to drag just a little bit more at that, um, at those higher player counts. But I think it's still great for that, for those higher player counts. And 
um, really just for how beautiful the game is um, and how easy it is to play and pick up. I think it's a real solid choice um, for, for a lot of different groups of people. And it's good because so, the groups work you, together, right? They work together on helping each other with their cards and stuff. So it's got a cooperative aspect. Right. The, uh, I was kind of soured on Mysterium. The first time that I ever played it was at a kind of impromptu board game event here in our, in our town in our local library in the basement. And the guy that brought it, uh, the game was just brand new, brand spanking new at the time. So it was kind of on my radar. Uh, I sat down to play it with him. He was playing the ghost and when he would, I was sitting to his right. So this is on his right. And as he handed out okay. the cards, he would hand them out starting from the left and going oh, around yeah. and I would be the last one to get my cards. So everyone's, the person on their left got a chance to see their cards for like 10 minutes and then he would hand cards to me and then he would just flip the timer. So I, I think it's like a two minute timer or whatever the yeah. timer is, two or three minute timer. So I literally only had my cards for three minutes while the person sitting across from me had their cards for like 10 minutes and was already like, eh, I have an idea. They've already discussed them. And I was like, this game sucks. <laughs> which is not to clarify not really how you should play the game you should kind of hand them out face down and then everyone can kind of reveal at the same right. time so i didn't like right. it's just like i didn't really like the game i have gone on since as this game has been out for years i have gone on to play it um multiple times and i do enjoy it and and whatnot in fact um here in town there was a uh, Mysterium tournament, league tournament or whatever, where you would collect points based on how well you did. I actually did pretty well in the tournament and I won an official uh, from whatever the company's called or whatever, an official mask for the ghost. So it's a Mysterium wow. mask that I have <laughs> kind of hanging on my wall out in the other part of my apartment and stuff. Never used it but I always thought it would be interesting to maybe have someone with like their hood up and then just have a mask and play um, completely. So you just don't see their face. Maybe you don't even know who it is. Maybe they would just walk in the room and it would be kind of a creepy Halloween type thing or something, but the mask is kind of small. So I've, I've got kind of a big face. I've never really put it on or anything, but I do have an official from the company, a Mysterium mask for the ghost. So, yeah. Well, whenever we whenever we do get to play together, now I'm gonna tell you you have to wear that mask and we can play. No, <laughs> I don't. Yeah, I don't. It doesn't look like it fits me, to be honest. It's kind of this little kids like a little kids mask. It's a plastic like mask, and so I'll sure. have to sh show it to you at some point. Um, uh, but, so yeah, I have played this game Mysterium quite a bit, and it's fun. It's it's good too. I've heard people mix Dixit cards in, and then I've heard Mysterium mm -hmm. cards mixed in with Dixit just for gamers to just kind of have fun. So yeah, that's a, that's a good pick. So uh, going on to my number four, yeah, this is the one that I don't have anymore. I did own this game at one point and the game basically, so I'm gonna bring it up on the screen, but the game is basically, it's old. Uh, I believe it came in 1983 and it was the first kind of um, what they call hidden movement sort of game for me since now we've gone on and there's been a bunch of kind of hidden movement games uh, that are more modern but this one i thought was probably the best to pick because it's the easiest to play it has less comp complexity and it does meet the player count it's not a party game and that is scotland yard so scotland yard on oh, no, 83 i nailed it scotland yard is uh, a game where you have one person that is what they call Mr. X. Um, you can call him a spy, you can call him a killer, however you want to set up the theme of your game. But the Scotland Yard police are trying to find Mr. X. So one player, it's a one versus all. So one person plays Mr. X and they move around the board in secret, which is why they call it like kind of a hidden movement game. And so they are writing down uh, numbers uh, on the board the board has numbers and so they write down numbers of where they move the rest of the team that plays scotland yard they are all trying to work together to try to deduce you know where this person could be and there's the game offers clues for them to figure out uh how they moved by like a bus or a train and things like that so like oh he could have moved here because he used a train so you kind of do some deduction in where mr x is i have played this game quite a bit it 
I've never seen Mr. X win. <laughs> I, I've been Mr. X uh, myself a bunch of times. I'm terrible at it. I really enjoy like moving in secret and double bluffing people and be like, oh, did he move this way? Did he move this way? Oh, did he double back? And I think that's quite fun. Excuse me. Uh, but however, I've never won with Mr. X. I always screw something up by not looking at the board and being like, oh, I move here. Are you here? And it's like, dang it. <laughs> three turns in. I've had a three turn. Uh, people tease me about it. I've had a three turn Scotland Yard game when I was Mr. X. Because I just, because of where I started on the board and how I moved and like not seeing a route that someone could take, we did three turns and the game was over. And I was like, wow. Yeah. Um, so yes, uh, there's a lot of games that I'll probably talk about at the end of the video for some honorable mentions that have copied this idea of one person in secret and other people kind of moving to try to find them. But um, we'll talk about those later. So yeah, number four, Scotland Yard for me. Yeah, and I, I have not played Scotland Yard. When you were describing it, I knew which game you were talking about, though, so mm -hmm. I am familiar with the game. Cool. Um, I played some hidden movement games. Um, yeah, for me, I find that, that some of them, you know, they're, they're, they're a little fragile. If somebody does, you know, whoever's doing the hidden movement, if they do something just wrong or they record something wrong on some of these games, the whole thing could kind of fall apart. Um, so that's one thing I do worry about with them. I don't know with uh, Scotland Yard if, if that's a possibility or not, but, um, sure. uh, but, uh, I I've had some fun with hidden movement games. Um, I don't think I have any on my list today though. <laughs> okay. All right. So on to my number four. Okay. Um, so my number four is probably the most obvious choice we could pick. Um, seven wonders. Um, I, I, you know, I almost didn't want to pick it because it was almost too obvious. But um, Seven Wonders is uh, came out in 2010, um, so it's it's a very well known game. It's been around for quite a while. Uh, you go anywhere, a lot of people know about it. Um, uh, the great thing about Seven Wonders and a lot of these games that um, I think are good in this situation with more players is people are all they're playing at the same time you're not waiting for somebody else to take a turn everybody um it's a card drafting game um so basically everybody has their own wonder that they're they're handed out based off the seven wonders of the ancient world um and then when i say by you know the, the card drafting is essentially everybody gets a hand of cards you pick one you put it down face down in front of you once everybody's done that they pass their cards to the left or to the right depending on the round Everybody reveals their cards at the same time, um, and you're kind of based, building up your own tableau in front of you to, to score points, and there's different ways to score points. There's science cards, there's military cards, um, there's goods cards that I don't, I don't remember if that's what they're called, resources essentially that allow you to get other cards in the future. Um, there's some currency in the game for buying resources from other people and other things like that, or buying cards themselves. Um, but the great thing about the game is everybody's playing at the same time. And for the most part, there isn't a lot of downtime. Um, there's a couple downfalls. Um, if you have somebody who is, a, you know, a less experienced or weaker player next to you, you can sometimes take advantage of that and they'll leave you some cards that maybe they shouldn't have. Um, and I've also heard discussion that people, a lot of people actually enjoy this at a little bit slow, uh, lower play count because, um, when you play at the full complement of seven, you only get to see the cards once, you know, that were in your hand that you're passing around. Uh, if okay. you play with three or, three or four people, you might get to see that hand come back to you, you know, kind of plan yeah. on that coming back. So I understand that critique, but I still think it plays just great at six or seven players. Um, and I'm always ready to play that game. I, I just think it's an excellent game. Yeah, that one's uh, – that one just plays up to seven, right? Like that's the maximum. Yes seven right right okay yeah that one's one that's kind of like i really enjoy the theme of seven wonders i never really got into seven wonders when it came out i played it <clears throat> many many years later um, when someone kind of explained it to me and explained it to me in front of a, a whole i think we must have had the full count of seven or whatever um so um i'm gonna move on to uh, my number three um before i comment anymore uh, I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't have 
my number three. Um, I don't own a copy of it. So what I'm going to be showing you is what I consider a far, far superior version. My number three is Seven Wonders. Um, <laughs> I'm holding up Seven Wonders Duel because, uh, which Duel is the two player game to only two players, um, no more, no less. Um, but I am putting Seven Wonders on because this obviously would not count. Um, and I'm doing, this is kind of one I have to explain a little bit. I am not a Seven Wonders fan. I am a Seven Wonders dual huge fan. In fact, if I can brag for just a second, um, a few years ago, I was the North Dakota state champion at Seven Wonders Duel. <laughs> That's so stupid. <laughs> Oh man, I was gonna like put it on my resume and everything as a joke. Like once I once took play first place in the Seven Wonders Duel tournament, <laughs> North Dakota State tournament. Um, so I do love Duel. I've played it a lot. I like the expansion for it, Pantheon. But anyways, getting back to actual Seven Wonders, I don't enjoy that game so much, and that's because it's it's it has been soured for me. The first time I played it was kind of like I don't like this i don't know what's going on um i have played it since then where i've got more of an idea of what's going on the reason why it's on my list is because i know that i was trying to formulate some things kind of like you said that it's like oh this has got to be on the list because it's easy to play it's popular it's still being made it's not like some out of print random thing that i would put on my list you can find it on amazon if anyone sees this and they think oh that sounds cool um that's why it's on my list more of just for the fact of the availability and the ease to play it and things like that. Um, it's not number three because it's my number three favorite game. Um, I would pick some other ones before this. Um, but yeah, so kind of crossed over there with the seven wonders. Um, did you get into the expansion world in this game? Cause I know there's a bunch of expansions and stuff. You know, I never did. Um, I was interested in it, but I never did. I know, of, yeah. I think, three or four right off the top of my head, but um, hmm. leaders and cities, and I think Babel was one that introduced um, a little more interaction between players, um, but I, yeah, I've never tried any of them. Ironically, I don't, like I said, I'm repeating myself, I don't care for Seven Wonders so much. I will play it, yes, I do accept it as a good game, yes. But it's um, made by one of my two favorite designers. I'm not sure how to say it. It's Antoine Bauza, I think, if I'm taking a stab. He is one of my two favorite designers. I like his games. Um, Oceanos and uh, what's it, Tokaido and stuff like those are games I really enjoy. Seven Wonders, not so much. So I don't have it in my collection. So that's my number three, I guess, Seven Wonders. Okay. Um. So my number three is a little bit newer game, um, cool. and it's by uh, Simon or Come On, or they were cool mini or not. They keep changing their names, so I don't really know how to say it. I think it's Come On now, um, and it's Ethnos. Um, mm. And so Ethnos is a really interesting game. Um, quite honestly, when I first saw reviews of it and things like that, I wasn't interested. I think the board's ugly, um, but essentially. What it is is it's it's a lot like Ticket to Ride in some ways. Um, there's a there's a stack of cards out that are face down, and then there's so many cards that are laid face up, and then you're trying to it's a set collection game, and so you're trying to um, each card has oh um, has a color which corresponds to a, a section on the map. So they add a little bit of area control in the game, um, but each card not only has a color but it has like a faction. Um, like a different fantasy race or whatever. Um, um, so, and then you play with, I think it came, I can't remember how many it comes with. There's 10 or 12 different races in the game and you pick out six or seven of them to play with each game. Um, and, and then what happens is you play through three rounds on a, on a higher count game on the lower count or lower player count. I think you only play with two rounds, but we're talking higher player counts here. So you play through three rounds um, and essentially um, there's three dragon cards that get mixed into the bottom half of the deck. And so there's a little bit of push your luck going on because as you're going through and drawing cards, whoever draws the third dragon out of the deck that ends the round. Um, and so the reason I say it's like ticket to ride is once you have a hand of cards and let's say you want to play three of a kind down either by color or by uh, race, um, 
then you get to do a certain thing based on what the race is. And usually that, that applies to the area control part of the game. Um, and you score points a lot like in Ticket to Ride. You know, if you've got, if you get a three of a kind, you set down, it's worth so many points. If you get a four of a kind, it's, it's worth so many points right off the bat on top of the area control. Now, the reason I brought up that I thought it was ugly when I first saw it is I had no interest in even really playing the game. I went to a friend's game night, and he, he had the game. And, wow, it was just a ton of fun. You know, it was one of those deals where um, I didn't really give it a, a second chance. You know, I wouldn't have given it a second thought except showed up, played it, and went, wow, this is a great game. Glad I, <laughs> glad it was kind of almost forced upon me. Um, I really enjoyed it. Okay. I played this game uh, once when it came out. Someone brought it over to somebody's house, set it up, and they were kind of learning. We were just kind of learning how to play it and stuff. I actually don't really care for this game. Granted, I've only played it once, but sometimes you can play a game once and you just, you just kind of know. Other games, right. um, such as, like um, like I said earlier, Mysterium, you know, you have other plays, and you're like, yeah, this actually is a good game. Um, Ethnos, as we said at the beginning of the video, I am big in theme. And this game looks like it gives you this big fantasy sort of theme. It looks like it really delivers. And in reality, instead of collecting clubs and diamonds and hearts, you're collecting, like, skeletons or whatever. I only played it once. Mm -hmm. And um, so that part was just like kind of a letdown for me as someone who's really into a thematic kind of story driven gamer. And the second part is that area control um, out of all the mechanics out there, worker placement, push your luck, area control is one that I am really bad at. I don't know why I'm just spatially. I'm not like spatial abstract or something trying to figure things out. Um, I don't necessarily enjoy uh, area control movement or area control games um, with a caveat of I do play a few. Uh, World's Fair um, is an area control game that I, I do enjoy that one. Not good at it. Um, I do play Risk and things like that, which are also kind of controlling the parts of the board or whatnot. Um, there's a, another game called Viral that is an area control. Not good at that game either, but I do own it and I do play it and I will play it. Uh, this one just for those two reasons being like it's an area control game and the theme is just not not thick it's not there um this it was kind of a pass for me but that that's cool i didn't know it played up to what's it, it must play six i think it's two. yeah it's it's two to six players um, i think we played with like three okay or something like that a lower player count and so i actually I, I do enjoy it a lot more at a little higher player count so oh you do okay yeah and the board is like an island or something and you're just trying to control parts of the island yeah there's correct? there's six sections on the island and the color of each section corresponds to the colors of the cards so um yeah some... I, sorry to cut you off i i have a I, funny enough i you'll find i even have another area control type game coming up here and area <laughs> control is not actually too much of my thing either um mm. but but these cool. couple of games i have on my list yeah, <laughs> these couple of things, couple of games I have on my list, they, um, I guess they make up for it in other areas for me. So, <laughs> cool. So, uh, number two, let me look at my list. Oh yes. Yeah. So we're gonna fly through my number two pretty quickly. Um, it's about a bunch of uh, psychics going to a house and figuring out like a murder. And so, Mysterium <laughs> is my number two. My box is a little little beat up i think i sat on it and so um yeah so for all this just to kind of recap for all the same reasons the art is phenomenal it's uh it's a game that's quite cool like i said i played it a bit in a tournament i won a mask and um i like the fact that it's cooperative in the sense you know that people can get their cards and say, Hey, help me. What do you think this is? Well, I tried the Butler last time and it wasn't, you know, and things like that. And you can bet on other, but there's also, you can bet your like, they're called clairvoyant tokens, but it's basically just betting on people, whether if they're right or wrong. And sometimes you just run out of right guesses. So you just put wrong guesses on people and you're like, sorry, Brad, <laughs> I'm just <laughs> guessing that you're wrong because that's all I have are wrong guesses. And that part's kind of funny. Um, I recently, I actually just, played this game um 
well, recently meaning like within the last few months. Um, and we basically had everyone get all the way down because like you said, you have to go through like a person, a place, and then to get through to the end um, before you go on to uh, what I call the showcase showdown, you have to get everyone through the object. And we had everyone done um, except for this teenage girl that we were playing with who had been just awesome at the game. Person, first guess, correct. Location, first guess, correct. And then she sat on her on her object for the entire game until we ran out of time. And it's like, we lost, we lost the game because of her. Not that I'm putting her down or anything. I just think it's hilarious. That it's like, we were all struggling and she did so well, got all the way to the end and I like, couldn't close it. Like couldn't get it. So we ended up losing the game and not moving on. Um, the, the plus side is like I said, the artwork and the player count is great. Cause you want more players. Um, the downside is like you said, there's some downtime, which is usually not too bad. Cause when I'm the ghost, I usually tell, which I usually am and end up being the ghost. I, or the spirit, sorry, I guess they call it a spirit. Um, I usually encourage people at the table to talk amongst themselves as I'm deliberating and thinking of cards. So they don't just kind of sit there and be like, Mm-hmm. we're just you know we're, we're playing a game we're waiting so they'll take take off on other conversations about this that the other thing uh little joey's baseball practice was the other day got canceled so they'll kind of talk until i'm i'm ready and start handing out cards and flip the timer and stuff like that so the downtime like you said yes i acknowledge that it's there i haven't had a huge problem with it because i encourage my players hey talk amongst yourselves go get another coffee or you know whatever um but i really like playing um mysterium um yeah so another another game that's both on, on our list all right um my number two is the other game i mentioned with some area control on it um and um this is a second edition but it's mission red planet um don't know if you've played it or not mm-hmm. but but um game by uh fantasy flight games um bruno Cathala and bruno fi duty um and the second edition, I never played the first edition, but it's on like the second edition um, fixed you know, some of the issues from the first edition quite a bit. Uh, again, this, I think the second edition came out in 2015. Um, does, you know, just hit that six player mark so I could throw it on this list here. Um, but when I have six players, this is a game I definitely try to get out. Um, essentially, um, everybody has a hand of nine cards, they're numbered one through nine. Um, and everybody has their own group of little um, astronauts, the little plastic mini astronauts. Um, and and there's a, the board is Mars and the moon, what's the moon of Mars, Phobos? I don't remember. But, yeah. um, and, and essentially what you're trying to do is get people on the, your astronauts on these little um, spaceships or rockets. Um, and you put them on there depending on what card you play out of your hand. Um, and, some of the cards allow you to launch a rocket off. Um, some of them, you know, make you get rid of or move players or move astronauts from rocket to rocket, move astronauts that have already landed on Mars. Um, and, there, you know, I'm not describing it super well. But essentially, um, it's an interesting thing where um, there's a countdown that goes down in the second edition of the game. I think the first edition, they did it backwards. They got it right in the second edition. Um, whoever's first player counts down um, nine, you know, from nine to one. And if you had the nine card, so everybody picks a card, puts a face down somewhere to like a hand drafting game, except you have your own hand in this game. You don't, you don't send it around. Um, but if you had a nine, then everybody flips over their nines at the same time and does the action that the nine card says to do. And you just keep going down the, the countdown and you do it that way. Um, but he said, yeah, but once you play one of those number cards, uh, numbered cards down they stay on the table yeah. and one of the cards allows you to pull them all back into your hand mm-hmm. so you're you know almost wasting a turn when you have to do that but you have to or else you really get yourself in a bind towards the end of the game mm-hmm. um, you know there's some some cards that allow you to uh, manipulate the area control on the different sections of mars um, you know uh, you, you gain you get you get these gems or crystals or whatever they are. That's how you score points if you have the area majority on a certain area. Um, and uh, there's some hidden information on some cards. Sometimes you can tuck them under a board. Um, at the end of the game, you'll flip it over. It'll say, "Oh, if you had an odd number of astronauts on here, they don't count or whatever." You know, you can't win that section or whatever it might be. So 
Um, there's some some gotchas in there um, and uh, really interesting mechanisms. And I think it really plays well with, a, with a, uh, quite a few players. Yeah, there's some nasty cards in this game, right? There's kind of a little bit of a take that sort of thing. Like, oh, you thought you were going to go on that ship? I don't think so. That ship sailed or rocket or whatever. Yeah. I, I do own this game. Um, I do enjoy it. I have not played it a whole lot. I bought it and kind of played it. You know, until you go, oh, okay, that's how the game plays. And then it's kind of hit my shelf. But that doesn't mean I don't like it. I do like the, I have the same one as you. I have this, the newer kind of nice second edition by Fantasy Flight. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's another air control game. And so it's probably not the, the top for me, but I do enjoy it. Um, so to talk a little bit about what I like about it, to use a little bit of game theory terminology, it's a variable phase order game. Um, which basically variable phase order means like that the the phases of the rounds the player turns are not the same and they will not be the same they're constantly being variabled and so instead of just it's always going to go from me to the left to the left to the left to the left or whatever like that it's going to be like me and then you and then so and so and it's every time it's going to be different there's a variable phase order and so this takes something that I really enjoy and I looked at that mechanism because if you go early you get kind of a weak what i call a weak power like you don't get to do a whole bunch but you get to go early and so the board state is kind of where it's at when you when you go early if you go late you get to do something that is what i call like a, a stronger power but you don't even know if that's going to be able to be done because everyone else is going to go ahead before you or most people are going to go before you and so there's kind of that middle area of like in the middle there's kind of some decent abilities and this is thrown in from a game called Citadels, which has the same sort of picking a number, kind of drafting. This one you actually do kind of pass, pick and pass, and drafting a number of when you want to go, or when you want to wake up and like take your turn. You can go early, or you can go late and do something awesome, but you might not even be able to do it because someone has like changed the state of the board or the state of the game and stuff, and so you can't even really do it and I do enjoy that aspect of the game <laughs> that's maybe not so much the area control I'm always trying to rack my brain on that part but I do like the variable phase order aspect to uh, Mission Red Planet it actually is on my um, kind of honorable mention which I'm, I'll go through when we get to the end or whatnot I'll go through some of my honorable mentions um, but yeah good good pick well we'll start off with uh, or end, end off I should say with the number one um, the, my number one I've played, I put it because I played it a lot. It's pretty easy to learn. I've taught it a lot. It was on my 10 by 10 one year. So, I mean, I did play at least 10 games of it and I know I've played more. The big controversy around this game. I don't know about, I don't know if you know about this, Brad, um, big controversy on what the actual title of the game is. Oh, I know what um, it is. <laughs> what? I know what it is now. <laughs> Uh, so my number one is uh, Camel Up or Camel Cup. I always call it Camel Cup because it's like um, it, the game is a, basically you're doing kind of like a racing, um, racing camels. So I, there's a trophy like a cup. So I always think it's Camel Cup. Other people have jumped like it's Camel Up, it's Camel <laughs> Cup. Um, so there's, there's kind of a little bit of a thing with gamers as far as how you pronounce it. The copy that I have is the new, newer copy. I don't know if it's still by Z-Man. I'm not sure. Not that it really matters. No, it's by Egrich Spiel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, that's the, I have the. I got the old one. Yep. I got the, is, <laughs> that's by Z-Man, isn't it? Yes. Yep. Yeah. So this is by Egrich Spiel. They must have caught, like bought the the rights for the game and stuff. And so I have the, the newer version of it or whatever. But um, in Camel Cup you are basically, um, you're not racing camels. It's one of the things that new players will always kind of do when I start pulling out the components and stuff. They'll grab, oh, I want the yellow camel. camel. Oh, I'm taking red. And people start taking, and I'll say, yeah, no, we're basically sitting in the, the stands, like placing bets on camels. So nobody owns any particular camel. And that's, that's kind of an interesting thing. It's not the first game that's done that. I mean, there's been a bunch of bettings, racing type games like that. But Camel Cup is one that I've taught a lot. I've had a lot of good fun with. I've had a lot of what they, the board gamers call like stand-up moments. 
kind of things where it's like, oh my gosh, I've had this game completely crash on me as far as like I had all these bets in that like they didn't happen because the game is quite chaotic. It is quite random the way that the, the camels move. They do kind of stack and so camels can kind of piggyback other camels and you're always kind of guessing who's going to be in first, who's going to be in second. And just with a roll of a die, you can be like oh now i was betting on purple and purple's like in last place or something like that so that's the one criticism that i've read online for special euro gamers that, that want control is that there's not a whole lot of control you just kind of bet and hope you get lucky and i've crashed a few times but you know what i've had like all my bets come in and everything and so um, it's a really fun game it does play up to eight so you can get six seven eight players to play i'm not sure if that's something that's in the older version or not or what the player count is but the new player count does go up to eight and so camel cup is my number one because i've i just got so much enjoyment out of it i've just played it so much you had yeah, that I, game out because it's your number one is that why it was out no no i just grabbed oh. it i, oh, you did? I didn't okay. think about it pretty heavily but uh no nope, i didn't put it on my list of one thing I will say is, yeah, I think the first edition that I have only plays to six. So I did think about it, putting it on the, on the list anyway. Um, but I do find the second edition to be a lot more fun to play because of those black and white camels that go the opposite direction around the track. Um, yeah. That throws that extra bit of chaos in there. And um, what I find in the first edition is, yeah, if, if one of those camels does get out to a big lead, it does tend to just stay out in the lead. Whereas when you've got those black and white camels in there, um, there's a lot better chance that camel is going to take it backwards. Right, you can go backwards on the track. So, um, you know, if people are looking at it, I would definitely recommend second edition. If they're they're okay. going after it. So, yeah. I'd played the when I got into the game. I played the first, the one you have, if that's yeah, the first edition, yep. and yep. enjoyed it, and was always wanting to buy a copy. By the time I had some money to buy a copy, I went on Amazon, and it was like, oh. Do I buy the new edition or the other one? I bought the new edition. So that's the only reason why I ended up having it. If I would have bought it when it came out or whatever, I think it came out in 2015 because it was nominated for stuff. Um, I didn't buy it then. I probably would have had your edition, but I have the, the new edition. So yeah, my number one is Camel Cup. <laughs> All right. Well... My number one is a game I hadn't even really considered before um, played it at a, at a friend's house. Um, basically, it, uh, I backed the original kind of half original version or original half version is maybe how I should say it on Kickstarter. Uh, and it's a, it's a Stonemaier game uh, made with Bezier games. And you may have played this, may Castle, not. Something Castle. Between Two Castles of Mad King Ludwig, the most, um, you know, crazy name for a game you could ever come up with because it's a mixture of two games, Between Two Cities and the Castles Castle. of Mad King Ludwig. Um, and actually, both those games I enjoy quite a bit. Um, but Between Two Castles of Mad King Ludwig, um, it's a lot more like Between Two Cities than it is like Castles of Mad King Ludwig. But, but um in, in this game, just like in Between Two Cities, what happens is um, it, it's called Between Two. Um, in this one, you're building a castle on either side of you. You don't have a, you're not building something in front of you. Your, your playing space is actually between you and the people on, either, on your left and on your right. Um, and so you're sharing a castle with the person on your right. You're sharing a castle with the person on your left. Um, and it's a tile drafting game. So we're handing tiles around the, around the table. Same idea as Seven Wonders with the cards. You know, you lay them down and, you know, pick and pass kind of a thing. Okay. Um, and then you'll have your – so you'll draw two tiles. And then what you do is you look at them and you decide which castle each tile is going to go in. So you have to pick, you know, one of your tiles goes in the castle to your right, one goes into the castle to your left. Um, and where the interaction really comes in with the people beside you is you can say, no, I, I think you should not put that one in your – on the other castle you're on. You need to put that tile in our castle, the one we're sharing. Um, and at the oh. end of the game, what happens is um, you tally up the scores of the castles and they score where the castles of Mad King Ludwig comes into play is the scoring has a lot to do with like how castles of Mad King Ludwig, the game scores. Um, 
but you you actually take the lower of your two scores of your castles and that's your score for the game so you can't just focus on one castle and try to beef that up you have to make sure you're you're kind of equally you know putting the effort into both of your castles so um and, and it's an interesting idea um and if you interact with the people next to you, it's just kind of like any game, you know, you interact with people a little bit more, you get a little bit more enjoyment out of it. Um, but it's like most Stonemaier games, just very highly produced. Um, tiles are nice. Um, they have the, the plastic inserts and I'm, it's falling out of my brain who makes those. Um, um, but it, you know, the inserts are really nice in the game. You pull them out. I think it's game trays actually. Uh, think about it. You pull out your, your game tray, um, it has a lid on it, pull it off, you know, your tile, your piles of the tiles that you're going to pull up to play with are all ready to go. Everything is just set up and nice um, to play with. And uh, the tiles interact in different ways. And it's really just an enjoyable game for me. And it's almost crazy because of other, all the games I brought up on my list, this is probably by far the lowest ranked on BGG, but it just <laughs> scratches an itch for me just the right wow. way. Um, and like I said, I, if I hadn't played at a friend's house, I would have probably not gone after it because um, it's kind of the, the king of Tokyo, king of New York thing that we talked about earlier. Okay. Because, I'm going, you know, if I'm playing this type of game, why wouldn't I just play between two cities? It's a little bit simpler. There isn't quite as much to it. But for whatever reason, um, what they added into this game just isn't that much harder to pick up in my, uh, in my mind. And it really adds so much more depth to the game than you have in between two cities. Um, um, I enjoy Between Two Cities quite a bit, but if I'm going to bother teaching that, I can teach a couple extra rules for Between Two Castles, which I think is a, a much better game. So, um. The one Stonemaier game I don't... Actually, no, I should say the I have two Stonemaier games. There, there are two Stonemaier games that I do not own. I, I love everything by that company. That's one of them. And I think Euphoria, which is one that goes back quite a ways, is another Stonemaier game that I don't have. But I, I think everything that Stonemaier does, I, I love. I pick up, like you said, the components are great. I haven't done this one. And because it's because I've played all the other game. I have not played this game. I have played the other games that this is like an amalgamation of. And not really just was didn't really like stick with me i guess and so i had uh gone to a convention a few years back or whenever the game came out and saw some people playing it and kind of observed and like looked over shoulders and stuff like that but i've not actually sat and played it myself uh i i, I did play there's there's castles of mad king ludwig and then there's isn't there one that's like palaces of yeah something yeah i've played those two and then between two cities. So yeah, so I've kind of played a bunch of those. This is one that I just have not actually played, this combination of all these games. Sure. Yeah, what happened to me there was a I think there was a really good Amazon sale on it. Um okay. I think it's clear to me Stonemeyer hasn't done real well with this game as far as sales because you know, they like um Jamie, he likes to put out lots of expansions to his games when they when they do well and I don't think there's one on one anywhere in the works for this game. <laughs> it just hasn't been as popular. It's probably something that's mainly just me because honestly, this is maybe a top 15 game for me. I just like it that wow. much. It's, it's just one of those oddball things. I never would have guessed would have stuck, but it stuck for me. Um, um, to, the, to me, the biggest issue of this game is the tiles are are small enough where it's hard to see, you know, if you have to kind of look across the table a little bit, it's kind of hard to see what people have on their tiles. That's really the biggest issue. Um, in fact, I don't know if you saw, but on, on April 1st, April Fools, uh, Stonemeyer put out kind of as a gag thing, um, a little uh, magnifying glass for basically for this game and some of their other ones. So you could see things, you know, they have little Easter eggs and things um, all over huh. the tiles. And he did it as a joke, but he said it actually sold pretty well. So <laughs> it's the novelty magnifying glass. So <laughs> Yeah, I was uh, doing a video with someone else who was talking. We were talking about Arkham Horror, the card game, and how there was this joke on April 1st about Barkham Horror with, like, dogs and cats. Um, and that's, like, going to become a thing now. People were like, I want this. It's... Um, and then they they released this like it was just a joke. People were like, oh, that's I'm bummed. 
And so there was enough outcry for people for Fantasy Flight to say, well, we're actually going to make Barkham Horror. <laughs> I don't know. My buddy's excited, but I'm, I'm not. I, I like... Unless if I'm playing with kids or like family nights or something, I, I like to have a little more theme than just like dogs and cats and stuff. But right. Um, usually kind of how I round out these videos is I have some kind of honorable mentions of, that I, I'm like, these are pretty good too. They just, because we're only doing five and I came up with a whole bunch, I just kind of throw out there. I don't know if you have any in the, I'm putting you on the spot, but if you had any that you want to throw out and then we can just spend the next maybe five to 10 minutes just talking about our honorable mentions and then sure, we'll yeah. kind of close it out. So do you have any that you didn't quite make the list that you were like, yeah, that was a good one. Yeah, I actually had a few. Um, and unfortunately one of them, I piled all my games on top of, so um, give me a second. Here. I'm thinking we might have uh even more crossover with our Libertalia. I don't, I don't know, know this you're... one. Mm -mm. Okay. Um, so Libertalia is, well, um, everybody has their own deck of cards, but it's exactly the same deck. Uh, they're number one through 30. Um, you know, it's a pirate, pirate game. Um, and essentially you're trying to get a bunch of treasures off of a ship. And it's kind of similar to what we talked about. Um, with Mission Red Planet, you know, depending on your numbers, there's more powerful actions and, you know, everybody's kind of playing off the same cards. And, um, but, but the thing I really like about it, again, is people are playing cards down at the same time. You don't know what other people are playing. You're trying to guess um, what they're going to play and how it's going to affect you on the card that you're playing because, you know, certain numbers will go first. Um, and I can't remember how you, what term you used for, uh, Mission Red Planet, um, but it's kind of the same idea there. Not exactly yeah. the same, but pretty close. So, okay. um, real enjoyable game, and uh, I, I recommend it. It's it's a it's a fun game to play. Um, pretty easy to pick up. Has a um, a day and a night uh, phase. Um, you know, you play one card for the day, one card for the night, and and uh, it's been a while since I played, so I don't want to try to explain a whole bunch more and get it wrong, but. Um, it is and it's quite an enjoyable game. It plays pretty well at six players. Okay, cool. Um, I actually have a, a list of ones, which, considering how much crossover we had, I probably should have just swapped out some of these just to show them off. Um, because I have a list, I did not go and grab them, so I'm just going to ramble them off. Um, one of them is uh, called The Last Friday which is going back to that Scotland Yard, sort of one person's moving in secret. And it's essentially, I mean, ugh, I should have gotten the game because you really need to see the cover. It's Friday the 13th, like the board game. Mm -hmm. um, but they couldn't get the licensing or there was not some kind of IP issues or something. So instead it's called The Last Friday. So the theme is essentially you got all these people come into a cabin, um, summer camp type thing. And then you have a they don't call him Jason, but they have like a psycho killer or something that's moving in secret, trying to kill off all the camp counselors and things like that. It's got different phases to it. So there's kind of like a day and a night phase. There's a phase where like they try to run away from him. And then there's a phase where they can go and like actually kill him at the end. So it kind of plays like a movie. Honestly, it's off the list because it plays. Um, I haven't, first of all, I haven't played it a whole lot. Um, but it, secondly, it plays way too long than what it's, it's kind of a novelty thing, right? The board is huge. It looks great. But anyways, that one's called The Last Friday. Um, another one I have that I actually have never owned. Um, I've just played it a bunch from a buddy. It's called Abandoned Planet. And it's a game where everyone's trying to get off this planet that's like blowing up or whatever. And kind of like between two cities or whatever you are collecting resources to build a rocket to get off so you need like x amount of these parts and this and gasoline um and you can team up with anyone so this is a game where there's not a sole winner there's always two winners and you can team up with anyone in the game to be like i have these parts you have these parts we can team up and our parts together and then we both at the start of the round you have to finish out the phase at the start of the round we can launch our rocket and then will win as a team so you always have two winners in this game but the thing is is that you can only do it with a person on your right or on your left and then that person can only do it with the person on their right or their left so there's kind of a lot of backstabbing this one didn't make it on the list not because it's social deduction but 
just because there's a lot of um, negotiation. It's really a more negotiation game, but I do like, it's called Abandoned Planet. It's by some pretty big designer, but I can't think of his name off the top of my head. One next one is one that I actually had on my list, which I should have probably kept on there because I swapped it out for Seven Wonders. I do enjoy this one way more than Seven Wonders. It's called Shadows Over Camelot, mm -hmm. which um, plays, again, meets the criteria where you're playing Knights of the Round Table, trying to accomplish these missions and stuff. Um, I have won this game, but not a lot. Usually I end up losing this game. It didn't make it on the list because of our social deduction requirement. And so there is a, for those of you that haven't played Shadows of a Camelot does have a spot where you hand out cards that says like, if you're on a good team or if you're a traitor. And so there's kind of that element of like deducing who's the bad guy. Why did you do this? Why did you play that card there? And so the, that kind of took it off the list, but I just wanted to mention it anyway. So that's why Seven Wonders got in there. Uh, let's see, three more. Uh, Magic Maze, which plays up to eight. Um, in Magic Maze, you're all kind of working together to like move pieces throughout a maze and stuff, but I can only move pieces this way and you can only move pieces this way and there's a timer. Um, I don't know if you've played Magic Maze. It's kind of hard to describe without actually setting it up and doing it, um, but it's basically panic attack in a box is kind of what I call it. Um, since the first time I played it, there's this little token you can use because you can't talk in the game and so you there's this big pawn token that you can use to kind of set in front of someone which is the do something uh pawn and the rules say that you can stare at someone or you can put the pawn in front of them to let them know like hey you need to do something but our game group has gotten so <laughs> aggressive i guess that people start banging that thing in front of you and just banging away at it and just Bang and, and you sometimes you just freeze and you look and you're like, I don't, I don't. There's lots of things, there's four different characters to keep track of, and sometimes you have a, a what I call a brain fart, and you're like, I don't know what, what I got to move someone. I can, and so they're banging away on that thing. Oh, it just gives you a super. I know I'm not selling the game to anyone watching this. I should buy Magic Maze. It actually is a good game, you just got to get over the real time aspect. Um, Two more, uh, an old 1963 uh, game called No Thanks, or it's, mm -hmm. it's from 60s or 70s, it's old, No Thanks, plays up to seven. Um, that one is a card game. It's not necessarily a party game, but you can have a lot of fun with it. And so I'll just kind of move on from that one. And the last one didn't make my list because it's kind of a kid's game. Not that, that that's bad, but it could be a party game because a lot of kids' games do have that big social aspect to it. And I think it plays up to eight. Don't quote me. Like I said, I didn't pull these off the shelf, but it's called Happy Salmon. And Happy Salmon is could be quite possibly, yep, right there in the green fish. <laughs> um, I debated on like, is it a kind of a party game? Because you're basically standing up doing a lot of, things interacting with people at the table um giving high fives and fist bumps and things trying to work through your cards as fast as possible um i've played this with uh some people that i work with i had a excuse me a couple of rounds of it i they were totally not wanting to play i had to pull them out of offices to say just try this it takes 30 seconds to play and they didn't believe me they're like no it's 30 seconds i'm like 30 seconds just 30 seconds of your life to just play a game once and it was like pulling teeth just to like get these people. Got them in, explained it as quick as I could. We played a game, as you know, because you have it, it takes 30 seconds probably to play. And right. so we played it in 30 seconds. And I was like, okay, th thank you. I just wanted to try this new game out. Thanks everyone for playing. You guys can go back to your offices and, and things like that. And they're like, let's play it again. It plays so quick. We could just do another one. It's so quick. And so my coworkers and I probably played two or three or four. I don't really remember, but, but I, I just said, please, just one game. Um, that's one I like a lot too. Didn't make it to the list because I was thinking, yeah, maybe I should put something that's a little more thematic on the list and, and whatnot. So that's what I have. Did, did you have any others that you wanted to throw out there? Well, other than Between Two Cities, which I mentioned, um, last one is probably Jamaica, um, just because I've been playing it with my family quite a bit, and I just wanted to recognize it as a game that's um, pretty easy to learn. Um, you know, my, my eight-year-old 
is playing with us without any issue at all. Um, she absolutely loves playing it. Basically, everybody's playing as a pirate in the, I don't know, 1600s, I believe. And there, there's a race around the island of Jamaica. Um, and so it's not necessarily who wins the race, but it's whoever has the most money when the race ends. And um, it's it's quite fun. There's a, there's a little bit of take that here or there, um, but real easy to pick up. And the reason I didn't put it on my list is because I haven't played it at six players. Um, but when I went on BGG, I, I think it says that the you know the the best player count is six, and so that's why I just kind of wanted to mention it here because um, I've been playing it recently, and and it was easy for the whole family to pick it up. Uh, real easy. Yeah, I've uh, that's kind of an oldie but goodie kind of game from what I've uh, from what I know. I don't have it. I've never played it. I, uh, through some YouTube channels and stuff and reviewers, I have heard of it and kind of seen it, but I have not played it. It's kind of what they call an evergreen sort of game. Everyone really likes Jamaica. Is there other expansions for it? Do you know? There must be, I assume. I don't. You know, I've never heard of one, so I don't know without looking but I'm not aware of any expansions for Jamaica. Sometimes the base is all you need, especially yep. when you look at some fantasy flight games that have like 20 expansions. And it's like, I'm just good with the base game. You don't need to drop a thousand dollars into uh, one single game. Although Lord knows I've probably done it. Maybe not a thousand dollars, but anyway, so that's all I have for our top five six plus games that are non-party games not social deduction type games but actual real kind of what i would strategic or th thematic type games for us so uh everyone just i want to say thanks for watching and you know thank you for brad who i've finally get a chance to kind of see his face and whatnot for joining me for this list and um hopefully we'll get a chance to maybe come up with another idea and do another top five while we're kind of sequestered in our homes during this period sure. I'd, yeah i'd love to thanks so much for having me on i really appreciate the opportunity to uh get on here talk about some of my favorite games and get to get to know you a little bit yeah likewise no um no problem all right so everyone this is the end of the video Th thanks for watching and as always i'll see you guys all at the next video